Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. I'm going to start this episode off with a little bit of news. Yesterday was apparently World Password Day. Didn't even know that that was a thing, but that's what we were celebrating. And Alex Simmons, who is one of Microsoft's identity PMs, he wrote a blog article, which we'll link in the show notes. And by the way, a few people have reached out to me asking me when I say show notes, where are those? If you're listening to the podcast on a specific app, they will be located in the notes section of the app. And then if you watch it on YouTube, they're also in the de- description of the show. So we put all of our notes in there with the links and our contact information and everything else. So we'll put this blog article for you to read if you wanted to do that. But we'll give you a little summary. The announcement was that there's going to be an expansion of the FIDO2 standard in partnership with Apple and Google. Microsoft has long been in this space for passwordless authentication in partnership with the FIDO Alliance with pass keys and windows hello for business. But now Apple and Google have agreed to put the FIDO standard into their operating systems and into their browsers, which is huge. So hopefully you'll be able to authenticate passwordlessly into say Mac OS or the Safari browser to single sign on into something or Chrome or the Chrome OS. And of course, we're big fans of passwordless on this show. And there's a lot of reasons why you should go passwordless. Um, There's a statistic out there that there's 921 password attacks every second. So a lot of attackers are still using or looking for passwords. As well as we talked about it being fish resistant Right, So fish resistant means that there's nothing to actually give an attacker. We talked about MFA bombing last week where someone can call you and say, I'm going to send you a notification to your phone. I'm going to send you a code and you need to give that to me. With FIDO2 passkeys, you're sticking it into the device and you literally can't give them the multi-factor. So... Another nice thing is that the pass key can be used among a bunch of different devices. So like say for Windows Hello for Business, if you're using it natively on the TPM, you have to re-enroll each computer that you go to with a pass key. You can just transfer that key, that USB or whatever it is, to a different device and not have to re-enroll each time. We also announced passwordless support for our VDI infrastructure like Azure Virtual Desktop and Windows 365, which is currently in preview for Windows 11 with Windows 10 support coming very soon. There's some summary of other things like Windows Hello for Business Cloud Trust, which we had a specific episode on a few weeks back. If you missed that episode, I highly recommend that you go back and listen to it because it's a different way to enable hybrid Azure AD with Windows Hello for business using the cloud as a trust for your key rather than having to talk back to an on-prem active directory controller. So definitely take a look at that because it makes the deployment for any hybrid environment, which is probably the majority of organizations out there a lot easier for windows. Hello for business, multiple password accounts for Microsoft authenticator. This is also awesome because previously you could only have one account with a passwordless solution for your Microsoft Authenticator. And this means like um, for organizations, like if you if multiple organizations or multiple tenants, only one per device could do that. Now you can have multiple ones. And so that's huge. iOS is, is going to be coming out very shortly, if not already, and then Android soon to follow. And then the final announcement was temporary access pass for Azure AD for devices. This was something that was asked for by many Microsoft customers. 
now you're going to be able to sign in using a temporary access pass for the first time to a device. You can configure Windows Hello for Business on that device and you can join it to Azure AD all using a temporary access pass. So you don't need a password to do that. They can give you what's called a tap in Azure AD and you can use that to authenticate and then set up your password later on. So a lot of good announcements. I love the timing on World Password List Day or World Password Day, sorry. Uh, it should be renamed World Password List Day, I think now. If you think of Apple and Google and Microsoft, all major tech companies, but all three of them could not be more different. You think of Apple as, as primarily a hardware company with a great security story across their hardware. Really, really great hardware-based security, excellent silicon security, excellent OS security too. They, they don't get enough credit for that in all honesty. Some great engineering, but a, but a, a hardware-focused company at heart. You think of Google that's really even though they publish major operating systems, mostly operating system independent likes to build for the web first and really ubiquitous across the web web and primarily an advertising company. And then you think of Microsoft that does touch hardware with surface and Xbox, but also delivers a major operating system across billions of devices, as well as some major enterprise identity and cloud services. They're very, very different companies. Apple, Google, and Microsoft don't agree on anything. Hardly anything. And so here they are, these three tech titans, all saying there is an imperative, a security imperative to go passwordless. It is not that long ago that I sat in a chief information security officer's office and he told me he didn't believe in passwordless. He told me he was skeptical of it. And I just about fell out of my chair and started talking through that <laughs> assertion, but there are people out there like that. And so I implore you, if you know them, you know, continue to work to change their mind, continue to advocate, but this announcement and the content of it and the solution it's going to deliver is really game changing because what this is doing is solving for a lot of the challenges with physical hardware security keys and implementing them in hardware and software in a really secure but also roamable, roamable way so that if I have a passkey on my mobile device, I can use it to unlock something on my PC, as an example. Also, if I have multiple iPhones or an iPhone and a Macintosh, I can roam that passkey from device to device, probably through something like iCloud Sync, like there's iCloud Keychain today. But instead of syncing a password, it's syncing a passwordless credential. That's phenomenal. Is there some, some minor step down in security with this? Absolutely. There are problems to solve with this. And the FIDO standard, I'm sure, addresses some, if not all of them. But this is also where sometimes, as security practitioners, we need to recognize that if we give a little bet here and maybe make this a little less secure of an option, we can deliver way more security over here to way more people. Because as much as we as security geeks love hardware security keys and, and YubiKeys, and I have a, a YubiKey 5 that I carry with me, um, the fact is that for the mainstream folks, they're still not accessible for a variety of reasons. And the great thing about this is, guess what? Hardware security keys aren't going anywhere. So if you still want to enforce them in your enterprise, if you still want to use them, you still can. If you want to disable support for these, I bet you'll be able to at an operating system level. I bet your Windows um, management solution, whatever you use, could disable that from being used in, in the operating system. Same thing on Apple devices. It will be your choice. But if the choice is between continuing to go down the path with passwords and all of the flaws and fallacies that come with that, or moving to this model, even if it's not as good of security as hardware security keys, you know, for a couple of key reasons, because it goes back to, let me, let me finish the thought first and then I'll talk about that. Um, you can't stop progress in pursuit of perfection, right? And this is so clearly progress. This is such a great user experience. Now, let me address the second part of this. So one of the challenges with roaming security uh, pass keys, I guess is what we're calling them, is now 
the impetus goes on those synchronization services like iCloud as an example, that could now potentially be the weak spot where if I can break into Andy's iCloud account, then I have all of his pass keys. Well, that's the same problem we have today with like password managers. If I break into Andy's one password, I have the same level of access. So those are valid concerns, but they can be mitigated and mostly addressed. And the user benefit and user experience is light years ahead. So lots of good stuff here. Lots to still, you know, work through and, and validate. But the idea that this could be end to end from Windows to Android to Mac OS to iOS is truly fantastic and covers so many of the use cases out there. And I, I just think just what a tremendous win that is, you know, and, and I'm just so excited for this. What what a big deal. And, and again, you said as fans of passwordless, my goodness, this is excited because this is the announcement that brings passwordless to the mainstream. So I can't wait to see what's next and see this implemented. And speaking of passwords, I was hacked. And so oh no, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story. Adam has already heard the story. And of course, all my information security friends have heard it and got a kick out of it. But I wanted to tell this on the show because I think there are a lot of parallels in what happened mm -hmm. and how it played out to what it might look like for an enterprise. So let's start with what happened. So my oldest son a couple weeks ago said, Hey, let's call a family meeting. And so we've been doing these family meetings as a way to talk through different things when things happen. And so he called the family meeting and he sat down and he told us, my wife and I, his mom, that he discovered or knows the parental pin that I use on all the things to lock him out of different things. And so whether you are one of those parents who just say, I'm going to let my kid do whatever because they're going to discover it anyways, or you're one of those parents like me who lock everything down. I'm not here to give you advice, but that's how, how I do it. And that's what I do. And what happened was he discovered the pin. This pin is used for making sure that they only watch, you know, PG 13 movies and nothing rated R on like Netflix and Disney plus now with, you know, rated R movies there. And, um, it's also used to um, disable their uh, parental controls and screen time on iOS. I mean, it's used for everything. Um, I use a service called Next DNS, which is kind of like Open DNS. Um, I do recommend it for parents if you are looking for something to control content. They're not a sponsor of the show, but I've been very impressed with that service in general and it just filters dns it does um, kind of like an open dns plus a pie hole if you're familiar with pie holes so it blocks ads as well um, but there's a pin for that to disable it on their device and of course it's the same pin now infosec professionals will know we don't want to use the same pin for everything across the board but my wife is not an information security professional and it just makes it easier for her if we're using the same pin. Now, mm -hmm. he disclosed that he knew it, okay? And on top of that, he said that he knew it for over a year, and he's been exploiting it. So he's been disabling his parental controls at night to get more time or watch things or whatever. Advanced persistent threat. <laughs> Correct. And so, of course, this is a parallel to the real world, right? Like, attackers oftentimes are in your environment long before you discover them or long before they reveal themselves, I should say in this case. And so how do you react to them, you know, in your environment or really like even in this case, even though he was the one that was exploiting it, let's say he was the one that discovered it. How do you react to someone reporting that you have a vulnerability? Do you react in anger like hey you shouldn't have been poking around environment in my environment Missouri or governor you, <laughs> exactly right or are you more thankful mm -hmm. and try to remediate that and so I'll be honest as a parent before I said anything I did feel a flash of anger because he was doing something wrong 
I think any parent can empathize with that. And just, you know, when your kid is doing something wrong, you get upset. And I had to actually control myself and not yell at him because I'm like, okay, let's, let's talk through this. And I actually switched into like, you know, infosec <laughs> incident response. Um, but let, let's also talk about some other things before we go into the incident response. I actually had clues that this was going on and I ignored them. And I also think that that's a parallel, right? You may get some alerts or something like that and everybody's busy, but I remember inspecting their iPads and noticing that the parental controls were off. I assumed that it was my wife turning it off. But also, if you know iOS, the screen time feature and everything, it's, it's kind of deep within the, the settings system. It's not easy to find where all that content control is. So I should have known that they probably knew it, but I didn't follow up on it. And so, again, you know, lessons learned right? Like make sure that if you, if you see some alerts and you're kind of like, Hmm, that doesn't look right. Follow up on it and make sure that you're, you're investigating fully, I should say. And then I asked him also how he got the pin. And he told me that he saw his mom enter it in one time and it was displayed. She had hit the little I to reveal what was being typed in and he saw the pin get entered in and he was like, Hmm, maybe I should try that for other things. And of course that worked <laughs> also a parallel, right? <laughs> so if you're using the same password for all the things, that's what they're going to do. Attackers are going to try it. Your kids are credential and stuffing. It's great. <laughs> they are. They are. <laughs> And he's shoulder surfing, right? Like, mm -hmm. you got to make sure when you're entering in your passwords, like, don't have someone around so that they can see what you're entering in. So, finally, you know, I went into instant response. I reset all my pins. I verified all my security controls. Now, if you're like me, I thought about this. Like, how should I punish my kid, right? Because he obviously did something wrong and exploited this for a year. So I gave him a fine. So he was fined a week's allowance for this. Now, if you're a company and you discover this, you know, like you may want to involve, um, if there's a compliance agency that you uh, have, you might need to report to, or maybe even law enforcement, uh, depending on the level of a crime being committed or whatever. And so, you know, there may be a fine or penalty involved. And so there was in this case because... He was exploiting it, which is wrong. And so we had a little discussion afterwards about responsible disclosure versus exploiting a vulnerability. And, you know, I told him in the future, if you find something, you should responsibly disclose it because there's a certainly a moral aspect to that, right? Like some people, you may make more money or get personal gains from exploiting the vulnerability, but obviously as defenders and ethical hackers we want to responsibly disclose stuff and then finally i i offered him a bug bounty going forward that if he were to discover any vulnerabilities in my security controls that i would pay him a bonus on his allowance if that was discovered so that's the whole thing that happened um, they got a lot of lessons learned i think in just in general but i just saw this as a really interesting parallel to what might happen at a company and just a fun story to tell as a parent too, because I'm trying to train my kids to be hackers. Right. <laughs> I love the story. I definitely laughed out loud quite a bit when you first told it. Um, and I, I love the parallels, right? I mean, I was kind of cracking jokes as you're telling the story, but in, in all seriousness, you know, great lesson about responsible disclosure, um, bug bounties and, and, even for you, like all of the parallels between what defenders face every day. This is, it's such a hard business. And even InfoSec pr practitioners in our own homes are getting hacked. Like what, <laughs> what a great story to tell just, just as 
relating to the challenges people face every single day. And I, I think it's a great example of why shifting that mindset to that assume breach posture. And as opposed to a breach is the end of the world, it's contain the breach, limit the damage. That's really the goal anymore. And, and if you have it with proper isolation and proper defense in depth, you can achieve that. You can get to a point where, all right, great. You broke into one device. Who cares? You didn't gain lateral movement. You didn't get into anything else. You didn't get elevated privileges. Like you broke into one device. Congratulations, you know, <laughs> golf clap. So just great story. I love the parallels and, uh, um, you know, what an opportunity to use as, as a, as a learning touch as well. And I think we all use a lot of those tools like, um, screen time and iOS as an example, and have that four digit pin to, to keep them secure. And of course, why wouldn't you reuse it? <laughs> and why right. would it, and why wouldn't your kids try it on every one? That's brilliant. It, it was just yeah. a great cat and mouse story. Just such a parallel for the times. And for, for those who are in the industry and, and have kids, I do highly recommend that you try to pass on some of this stuff. They are not too young to learn at any age. My son is eight and 10, both of them. And I think I started them on a password vault two years ago. So they were six and eight. And I gave them a fairly complex password. It's a passphrase, but with you know, leet speak in there, like replacing zeros and O's and ones with I's. And it's probably 15 or like 20 characters long. And they remember their master password for their password vault. And that now they're knowing how to like go back and forth. I store their MFA keys within the secrets in one pass, one password, and they're able to copy it and paste it. And so they understand MFA. They understand a master password and a password vault. And they know that they have to remember their master password and everything else is super random. They've seen me enter in random passwords before. And so this is all stuff that they can learn. Um, and my son even joked uh, that his friend started uh, an Epic games account so that he could play Fortnite. And his mom made the password, wrote it down on a piece of paper and you know, he, she had it at work and the piece of paper or whatever, it was maybe on a notepad or something like that. And he didn't know the password. Um, but you know, you can train your kids at these age to use password vaults. And so I, I do have recommend, and maybe they'll pick up something. Maybe be, they'll be the next, you know, elite hackers out there and test them, see if they can break your security controls. You know, like Adam said, they were able to break one, but certainly they aren't able to get any of the crown jewels here because <laughs> they're on a seg segmented VLAN in the house. And, you know, there's other security controls that they, that they have to get past. But now they know I, I'd be happy for them to do a little bit of internal pen testing mm -hmm. and see if they can crack other things. Mm -hmm. So just raising my own elite internal pen testing team, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> there's a red team in the house. <laughs> yep. So anyways, that's, that's our fun little episode. Talk about passwords and passwordless. Anything else to add, Adam? Go passwordless. If not now, when's a better time to get started? Uh, I, I think the one update that you, you did speak to being a big deal, but really is that I've had customers ask about is multiple accounts for passwordless support in Microsoft Authenticator. So it does today support one consumer account and one enterprise account. But the update is going to add support for multiple enterprise accounts. And I know that's held a couple of enterprises back because they want to use it for like their admins to have, you know, two accounts or, or, or somebody who works for multiple tenants or whatever. So either way, great, great little update. And again, start kicking the tires on this stuff. It's clearly the future. This is the biggest vote of confidence possible. So we love passwordless. We hope you love passwordless too. spread the gospel of getting rid of passwords and let's move forward together. And again, let's keep in mind that if you have beef with one or more of the implementations of passkey support, you could still probably shut that down and use hardware security keys if you want. So this isn't making it worse, except for people who want it. And again, there's so many benefits of it that I would argue it's, it's definitely probably a winning trade.
So great show, Andy. Thanks for pulling the notes together as always. And uh, always fun to get together and chat security. That's our episode for this week. Thanks for listening and watching. Our information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or want to reach out and have topics you guys want to hear us talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.